Jack and Jill went up a hill to fetch a pail of water, a tale all but a select few are familiar with. But this particular story has little to do with hills or pails of water. However, dear listener, this tale of tales is not entirely dissimilar to the original yarn spun by the Brothers Grimm, as there is much blood to be shed, and the night is yet young. The time was some time after the moon strode her peak and began her descent again, with the edges of the sky turning the absolute blackness that occurs before dawn. And our friendly neighborhood alcoholic, let's call him Jeff, was in his usual spot, appearing to drown his sorrows in stale beer and cheap peanuts. As Jeff made eye contact with the embossed symbol at the bottom of the glass for the sixth time that night, He waved to the bartender for another. He slammed the glass down hard, but not so hard to break it, as he'd run up quite a tab once due to his habit of breaking the dishware here. The bartender kindly, but in no uncertain terms, informed him that he was cut off for the night and needed to leave. After refusing the offer of a cab from the owner of the bar, he slogged to the restroom to relieve himself. After fishing his pants back up and checking to make sure his pocket knife was still in his pocket, he headed to the bar's exit with some considered difficulty. When he was about 15 feet from the door, she walked in, and our alcoholic inebriated protagonist gawked as he felt his jaw commingle with his collarbone. She was beautiful, in a way broaching on ethereal. She reminded him of a dandelion puff that was about to be swept away by a slight breeze. She was tall, slender, and pale, coupling that with the silvery gray dress. Coupling that with the silvery gray dress, small slips of flat shoes, and the obviously artificially ash gray hair that was tied back with a nearly obsessive neatness, she seemed a veritable ray of starlight in the blackest abyss of this den of iniquity. As Jeff's higher mental faculties began returning in preparation for the hunt, he began to stammer out a weak, Well, hello. As far as first introductions go, he'd done better. She smiled a small, coy smile, and her eyes were filled with a mix between animalistic intensity and nearly Vulcan-level cold intellect. She was perfect. Hi there. Come here often. She knew full well the irony of the immaculate astral beauty delivering one of the most cliché, overused pickup lines on the seemingly depressed, drunk slob in front of her. He was attractive enough, but in need of a shower, shave, and some personal maintenance. This one-liner delivered to Jeff made him chuckle, and he stopped slouching as badly. When he was fully upright, he stood a solid six foot one, and even then he was only slightly taller than the newest member of the bar's ecosphere. He let his eyelids fall slightly and the corners of his mouth perk up gently, giving him a unique balance between arrogance and nonchalance. Given that the barkeep and I are on a first-name basis, I should say so. Ain't that right, Marquise? This elicited a glare and slow nod from the man behind the counter, knowing Jeff full well, especially as the reason he'd had to buy new glasses and dishware a full four times since taking ownership of the dive. Jeff had his own animalistic features, with sharp teeth, thick hair, and a borderline predatory feral attitude he has around people he classifies as his... type. Anyway, since you know Marquise now, I'm Jeff. However, I'm at a bit of a loss for yours. Well, I'm not as upfront with my info, so let's play a game. I'll give you three guesses and one hint. If you can guess it, I'll come sit with you and you can buy me a drink. And so began the short stint of guessing. Jeff quickly found that her name was neither Jane nor Jillian, and she certainly didn't change her name from Kitty to Karen after she bought a white Chrysler LeBaron, but he did get a chuckle for that guess. And the humor was enough to get her name, and she ordered the most expensive drink available. After a small discussion, they agreed that they would return to Jeff's home, When they reached his small yet accommodating apartment, they ascended the stairs to his third-floor room. So, Alice, 
What do you think of the dwelling of this drunkard? What you expected? Jeff opened the door. Alice took in her surroundings, and was surprised to see a space so organized and neat belong to someone who came off as a bit of a disheveled mess. It was a pleasant surprise, but one that gave way to concern for either Jeff or herself. She hadn't decided yet. It's definitely not what I expected. I am happily surprised, though. It should make tonight go infinitely smoother, not having to climb and jump over clutter like some sort of thespian or acrobat. Jeff raised an eyebrow at her seeming understanding of what his true intentions were, and in an effort to maintain the appearance of high society education that Alice seemed to ooze with, he replied in a non-committal, Quite true. However, in all honesty, Jeff hated having to put up this facade, and struggled to maintain it with his prey for any length of time. This was going to be a long, but fulfilling night. The two were a unique sight together, after Jeff had changed out of his ratty, beer-stained undershirt. They were both attractive in their own ways, but nearly polar opposites. Jeff was a large man, with a more roguish appearance, sporting a toned muscle structure and well-defined features. Alice was tall, slender, and seemed to be born in the wrong universe. She looked closer to an elven princess than a human being, with smooth skin, crisp facial features, and a small nose placed between two very gray eyes. The best part about this entire chance meeting is that neither knew each other's secrets. They both had a particular preference in their prey. Jeff preferred those who came off as snobbish in high society, whereas Alice had a penchant for those with more rugged features. It seemed that Jeff was overly hopeful and that Alice was slumming it when they went looking for their next target. Shall we just skip the introductions and formalities? Alice was eager to begin her plans for tonight. Yeah, might as well. It's already four in the morning and I've got work in about five hours, so... Yeah, I'm up for it when you are. Alice strode over to Jeff, set her right hand on his chest, and reached into his back pocket. After she fished the knife out of the loose pants, she pushed him down onto the couch. She tossed the knife aside and assumed a more predatory gait, striding one foot exactly in front of the other. Her hips swayed side to side as she came to stop next to Jeff. Wow! Didn't realize you had that much strength in you. Tonight's gonna be fun. Alice crouched next to him. You're going to have to put up a stronger resistance than that. Come on, stand. Jeff took this time to sweep Alice's feet from beneath her so she fell, and Jeff caught her right before she hit the ground. Jeff then stood with Alice in his arms, and gave her previous line to her in half-tease, half-sneer. Oh, you're gonna have to put up a stronger resistance than that. <laughs> he set her down on her feet, and she saw a recent newspaper with a headline she was all too familiar with. You see, dear reader, there have been a string of missing persons and gruesome murders in Jeff and Alice's city, and the police and papers have grown desperate to find the people or at least answers to their whereabouts. With no hints, tips, or trails, the authorities have taken to relying on public assistance. The papers, however, needed to be careful with their stories, as Alice knew that the murders were very gruesome. Brutal decapitation and exsanguination, coupled with seeming ritualistic sacrifice, make for great novels, but are journalistic minefields. People are very touchy about the public knowing their loved one was turned into a statistic. What makes it even more frustrating is that there was very little pattern to it. Bodies were found everywhere from hotels and homes to alleys and small parks. One was even found inside of children's play equipment. It didn't matter to the culprit, or culprits, age, ethnicity, marriage, kids, or social standing. Everyone targeted ranged from wealthy, married, middle-aged businessmen, to the abandoned, destitute, elderly, female homeless population. The only thing linking the victims are that they're all found naked, and all are inscribed with strange symbols. But, not wanting to ruin the mood or grow suspicious of the company she currently kept, she disregarded the newspaper and turned to the task at hand. She began removing Jeff's clothing and crawled up his body, keeping low to him to conceal most of her body from his vision. After a while of adult-oriented entertainment, Jeff had fallen asleep, 
content with his newest conquest against the clique who he blamed for all his issues. Alice stood from the bed, which caused Jeff to wake. Oh, where are you going? This was a farce entirely, but Jeff was never one to break his act, even when the show was over. Time to do the ever lauded walk of shame! Alice left the room before Jeff had a chance to respond. She walked to the door, opened it, held it for a second or two, then closed it and walked gently to the bathroom. Taking care not to make a noise, she opened the door, stepped in, covered his mirror with a towel, and waited in the dark. After about two hours of patient waiting, she heard Jeff wake up and walk over to the bathroom. He opened the door, entirely oblivious of Alice waiting on the side of the doorframe. She crept behind him, making sure to look at the wall to avoid him getting that primal warning sense of being watched. As Jeff stared in bewilderment at his now-covered mirror, he didn't have time to react to the rag that smelled strongly of the ether he worked with as a janitor. By the time all that was going on clicked in his mind, he was unconscious. When Jeff had awoken, he found himself sluggish and bound tightly with shackles. He tried to jerk himself free, but was met with tremendous resistance from the shackles and sluggishness he can only attribute to being drugged. Good morning, sleepyhead. All traces of cynicism and snark were gone from her voice. Alice seemed genuinely chipper in this situation. What? What? What's, what's the meaning of this? Let me go, you damned sociopath! See, Jeff, I'm not a sociopath. I'm doing this for my own survival. Jeff could only stare, incredulous and skeptical, as he could not believe that such a woman had to resort to such extreme methods to ensure survival. What, did she believe Jeff was going to kill her? His only game was the sexual conquest, nothing so violent or bloody. What do you mean, your survival? You could have simply left last night. I wasn't any threat to you. What, why are you doing this? Oh, no, 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 Jeff, you misunderstand. You don't pose any danger to me. Even if I let you go and armed you with this knife that you owe so love. Alice took Jeff's pocket knife off the nightstand. But I do need you dead in order to survive. You do know the headlines of all those dead and missing people from the area, correct? Jeff nodded slowly, realization of what she's implying dawning on him, suddenly regretting springing for such a dive of an apartment. He wasn't even sure if he had downstairs neighbors to hear his screams. Even if he did, he doubted that they would care enough to call the police for him. So what? I've seen your face, so now you need to kill me? Is that it? <sighs> I don't know why I always expect people to understand the symbols I leave carved in the corpses. I barely even remember what they mean anymore. No, Jeff, why I need you dead is because I intend to drink your blood, take your form, and leave your body as an offering to my benefactor. In a more cliché way, my Dark Lord. Alice began carving a series of intricate lines, swoops and curves into the abdomen, torso, arms, and legs of Jeff's mortal flesh using the pocket knife from earlier all the while disregarding his screams that turned to cries that turned to whimpers. That's what those sigils do. Alice finished her work and planted the knife into Jeff's hand. Bring my god towards the corpse. The authorities have been covering it up to prevent mass hysteria, but the corpses they recovered have yet to be identified because they disappear very shortly after discovery. As Alice finished this statement, she stepped back and began to change. Her arms extended and grew extra joints. More appendages burst from her abdomen and her skin developed a rough green appearance, similar to an insect's carapace. By the time she was complete, she appeared as a massively sized praying mantis. Jeff could no longer see Alice's mouth move, but rather could hear her voice in his head. Now, now the, blood the blood is, is my survival. survival. The, the body, body is for my benefactor. benefactor. But remember, but remember how, how the, the bodies, bodies were also decapitated. Do you remember your basic high school science classes? The bizarre mating rituals of the mantis? That's why I do this. The consumption of your head allows me to change my form. I mean, sure, I could just tromp around decapitating people all willy-nilly. But where's the fun in that? 
These were the last things that Jeff heard before his head was removed by a swift grab, twist, and lift. His cranium and gray matter destined to fuel future killings, like countless before him. After that ritual, Alice had to admit that Jeff was unique. He had sarcasm, and a spunk that made the once Alice like him. Now he was dead, and Alice could be him. This new skin was going to be... spicy. As Jeff made eye contact with the embossed symbol on the bottom of the glass for the sixth time that As Jeff made eye contact with the embossed symbol on the bottom of the glass for the sixth time that night. That's really hard to say. <laughs> and the obviously artificially grit. Hmm. Coupling that with the silvery gray dress, small slips of Coupling that with the silvery gray dress, small Fuck! After she fis after she fished the night up, after she fished the knife out of those loose pants. What? People are very touchy about the public knowing their loved one was turned into a. St People are very touchy about knowing pu. Mm. One was even find. One was even found inside of a. Ch one was even found in there. Everyone targeted ranged from wealthy, married, middle-aged businessmen to the abandoned, destitute, elderly female host- Meh. Everyone targeted ranged from wealthy, married, middle-aged businessmen to the abandoned, destitute, elderly female homeless popli- Poplilation? I can't talk! After a while of adult-oriented entertainment, Jeff had fallen asleep, content with his newest conquest against the clique who he blamed all- Ah, bebe. She walked to the door, opened it, held it for a second or two, then closed it again. Mm. She walked to the door, opened it, held it for a second or two. Mm. As Jeff stared in bewilderment, fuck. As Jeff stared in bewilderment at his new co fuck. As Jeff stared in bewilderment at his now covered mirror, he didn't have time to react to the rag that smelled strongly of the ether he worked with as. In I almost had it that time. Jeff could no longer see Alice's mouth move, but rather he could he- mm. That's why I do this. Fuck. Hey guys, do you like our content? Do you want to support the show? Click the link in the description below to visit our donation page. All proceeds go towards new and better equipment and games you want to see us play. Everyone who donates will get a special shout out at the end of future videos, and we're currently working on setting up some special perks for you. If you don't want to donate, that's okay too. You can support us by subscribing and clicking that bell icon so you get notified whenever we put out a new video. A huge thank you to Kyle Sheridan for donating and helping to keep our show going. Thank you so much for checking out today's story. A huge thank you to my friend Adam Lloyd for helping me out today. Make sure to give him some love. Links in the description down below. If you'd like to see yesterday's story, click that box on the left. Or if you'd like to see something a little different, click that box on the right to check out our latest Let's Voice Act series. Thanks for watching. Stay creepy, everybody.